Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Ninth Circuit. We're happy to have with us uh, Judge uh, Rastani from the International Trade Court in um, uh, Washington, D.C., uh, who's helping us out as a visiting judge. We'll hear the cases in the order in which they appear on the day sheet. If counsel for appellants wish to reserve any time, it's not necessary that you tell us that, but it is necessary that you keep an eye on the clock because you will be the uh, keeper of your time. Good morning, I'm Juan Basombrio. I represent the uh, appellees and uh, may it please the court. Um, the court's absolutely right. There's no contract at all. Our position in the briefs and throughout the case has been that there was an exchange of diplomatic notes. There's no authority at all cited by the opposing side that an exchange of diplomatic notes results in any binding contract of any form. In any event, let's keep in mind that exchange took, took place in New Delhi. Those representations were not even made in the United States. Now, there's a second point to keep in mind in this regard. Even if there were a contract, that would be a contract between the US government and India. There was no contract with Mr. Barapind what about a third-party beneficiary contract? It's pretty clear that they intended to benefit Mr. Barapind, is it not? No, because... Oh, they say they won't torture him, and that doesn't mean that they're, it's in his favor? That it is not in his favor. It is the United States government has an obligation under FARA. Under FARA, it's only the obligation of the U.S. government. Now, but the, India... Uh, India. Me, the note said... India will not torture Barapind. Correct. And he's given the rights under the Convention Against Torture. No, he's not. That's not what it says. Let's, why don't we turn to what the notes say, which the notes were cited in pages 5 through 7 of the decision. And there were two notes, one of February 6, 2006, and one of March 28, 2006. First, India says... We're going to act, we have a good faith obligation not to act against the objectives of the convention. They repeat that statement in the second uh, diplomatic note of March 28, 2006. They are not saying we are not going to violate the convention. They're saying we have a good faith obligation, not a legal obligation, not to act against its purposes. Instead, they say, he will be subject to Indian law. And they cite the Constitution of India, they cite the criminal laws of India, which say that will protect him against torture. And then they say, importantly, in the second note at the end, once Mr. Barapint is extradited to the US government, we, to, to India, we will inform the US government of the status of the criminal action against them. So that is the only thing that, in, that India has undertaken to do, to make sure that he's subject to Indian law and we will keep the U.S. informed. So India takes the position that when they make a formal written representation that they have a good faith obligation not to act against the Convention Against Torture that doesn't give any rights to Mr. Barrett. Exactly, and that's the position the U.S. takes with all the treaties. For example, with the Law of the Sea Treaty that was signed by so, President... So th 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 that's just words in, in, in the wind? Uh, Not words in the wind. It means that he has the rights to pursue remedies under Indian law. And according to the district court judge, that's what he held. And what he does good faith obligation mean to you, sir? Does it mean I'm going to do something, or I may or I may not want to do something? Well, let me indicate to you what it means to me and what it means to India in this case. He, once he was returned to India, he was tried in a criminal case. He was acquitted of the three criminal charges. What is the substance of a good faith obligation not to uh, uh, violate the treaty? What, is, what, what does that mean? Well, I'm describing that. He came back to India. He was treated according to the law. He won, and he was acquitted. Game over. Six years later, 
he engages in separate, new, as they concede, allegedly criminal conduct. And then he, he's allegedly tortured in connection with something completely different six year, years later. So when India says, send them back, we're going to try him on these three criminal charges, he's not going to be tortured, he was not tortured. Your explanation of my question is unanswered. Well, you my, haven't told me what the content of good faith obligation means. Does it mean I will? Does it mean I might? What does it mean? In international law, the way it was stated here would mean exactly what India said, which is we will not act in a way that's against the objectives and purposes of the convention. And they did it. Well, that's the issue, isn't it? Did they? Well, and this was a 12B1 motion. It was in a 12B6. The judge looked at the preponderance of the evidence, and he concluded that all the evidence together showed that they complied with their good faith obligation, with what they had said. There's no guarantee by India that he will never be tortured in infinity in the future by some police department in India, regardless of what he says. That would be reading into the diplomatic notes things that are not there. Could, could you address, um, opposing counsel didn't mention this, but I, I was curious about our opinion in Blacksland, which seems to indicate that um, in the extradition process, the executive to executive agreements um, uh, don't waive sovereign immunity. And uh, opposing counsel argued that Blacksland was um, distinguishable. Um, can you address their um, distinction of Blacksland? Um, is Blacksland bl binding on us here? Blacksland is binding because of what the Ninth Circuit explained back in 2003. And, and their reasoning is very important. And you touched on it, Your Honor. It's the executive-focused nature, and that's the phrase used by the Ninth Circuit, that we must concentrate on. This is a discussion, if there's an agreement, an agreement between two foreign sovereigns. And according to Blacksland, it doesn't matter. In that case, it was Australia. And this is quoting from that decision. It doesn't matter whether or not Australia used the extradition process, whether that use was fraudulent. So to respond to Judge Bea farther, it doesn't matter whether India meant what it said. They did, because they didn't torture him. It doesn't matter, though, whether they acted in good faith or not. According to Braxland, it's an executive to executive process. I would argue that under Braxland, there's not even application of a third party beneficiary. Third party beneficiary is a matter of state law. And last time that the Ninth Circuit attempted, the last, the last time the Ninth Circuit attempted to use state law to define the FSIA and its exceptions, it was reversed by the Supreme Court in a unanimous decision, the Sachs versus OBB case. So you cannot use state law to apply the exceptions to the Sovereign Immunities Act because the Sovereign Immunities Act was a codification of international law by Congress in 1976. So yes, Braxland would be dispositive of the issue because this is not a matter of contract. It's a matter of international relations, and it doesn't matter what the intent of India was. Now, it's the same as to the convention. India didn't sign the convention. It signed the convention, I'm sorry, but didn't ratify it. So it is not bound by it. That's the law that we apply to the United States. But even if they had ratified it, it makes no difference. Because as Your Honor indicated earlier, there's no private right of action. And, and let me concentrate on that for a second. There's no private right of action under the convention. 
There's no private right of action either under the TVA. They mentioned the TVA, but, and, and my authority for that, which we cited, is the Mohammed case from the Supreme Court from 2012, 132 Supreme Court, 1702. The, and there, the TVA, the only private right of action, is against individual persons. In that case, an action was brought against the Palestinian Authority. The Supreme Court said you can't sue an entity. Here, initially, they sued a number of individual government officials, but they dismissed all of them. The only parties before you are the government of India, the state government of Punjab, and the, gover and the Punjab Police Department. And so they cannot assert a claim under any of this. So to your point, how could we possibly conclude that the government of India intended to waive its sovereign immunity and subject itself to a lawsuit by Mr. Berrapind in U.S. courts when he has no cause of action? <clears throat> that couldn't have even been contemplated. And if it was contemplated, the law of the Ninth Circuit indicates that that's something that had to be stated expressly in the written documentation. I, in this regard, there's another Supreme Court decision that's right on point. The Argentina versus Amaranda Hess decision, which we also cite from 1989, and that's at 488 U.S. 428. The Supreme Court said in a case involving precisely the FSIA, and I'm going to quote, that a state cannot waive its, immun its immunity under the FSIA by a treaty. Now, we're, here we're talking even about a treaty, not just an exchange of diplomatic notes. There's no doubt that a treaty is a contract. So even if we had a contract <clears throat> by a treaty that, quote, that contains no mention of a waiver of immunity to suit in U.S. courts or even the availability of a cause of action in the U.S. So here, that decision, I would say, if there's something, a decision that's compelling and binding, it's a Miranda Hess, because we are lacking the two elements. We have no express waiver of sovereign immunity in the diplomatic notes. We also have no reference to any available cause of action, and in fact, there is none. Now, that the United States Congress, when they enacted the FSIA, with respect to implied waiver, they gave three examples of implied waiver, and they are referred to in the Republic of the Philippines case from the Ninth Circuit in 2002. Only the second one is the one that's being invoked by uh, Mr. Barapind. Now, in that same case, the Ninth Circuit said that that exception deals with contractual choice of law clauses. Here we don't have also any choice of law clause. And the Ninth Circuit warned that we should not expand implied waiver beyond what was intended by the United States Congress. Remember here, sovereign immunity goes to the subject matter jurisdiction of courts. And the United States Congress decides what's your subject matter jurisdiction. And so that's why if you look at all the decisions that we've cited from the Ninth Circuit, going back 30 years, we in this circuit have always been very careful about the FSIA and not expanding unless there is a clear intent by the sovereign to waive immunity. And that's what we require. And so what did the district judge do? He looked at the cases, he looked at the diplomatic notes, and he listened to all the arguments. And he took in count, into account also the fact that Mr. Barapint is not a party to these diplomatic notes. And he concluded that based on all of that, on the preponderance of the evidence, on a 12B1 motion, that there was no implied waiver. I would submit that nothing that you have heard today from the other side or in their briefs demonstrates that the district judge committed an error of law or of fact 
when he made that decision. We have to look at the whole bundle like, which he lays out in a very orderly manner in his uh, decision. So, to further respond to Judge Bea, what, district, what the district judge said was that this representation, Your Honor, was, I will use his words, India gave a guarantee of humane treatment. No implication it is to be enforced in the U.S. Agreeing to abide by the convention, an international treaty, does not automatically mean agreeing to have U.S. courts adjudicate compliance. And that is precisely the position that the U.S. government has taken in prior cases, also as cited by the district judge. Thank you.